Hello and welcome to New Music Weekend 2021. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the International Clarinet Association for inviting us here today to speak about this amazing work. Uh, my name is Eric Schultz. I'm Assistant Professor of Clarinet at Coastal Carolina University here in South Carolina. And I'll be talking today with composer Yvonne Enrique Rodriguez. And uh, I think one of the beautiful things in this interview that we captured is actually our friendship. So I hope you can see that. And maybe it gets a little informal at times, but I hope, uh, I, th I think it's beautiful and I think you'll appreciate it. So um, for the first few minutes, we talk about his music more generally, some of the music of his that I've played with my chamber orchestra, uh, the Victory Players, which is a Purell plus percussion ensemble, um, and some of the other music I've heard of his um, premiered around the New York metropolitan area. Uh, this work was born out of the pandemic as my chamber orchestra was looking for um, pieces that we thought we could distance record and we thought duets would be easier. So we commissioned a series of duets for our project El Puerto Rico. Um, and this concert, the Identity Duets, is still available on New England Public Media YouTube if you'd like to check that um, concert out. These were all commissioned by um, MIFA, Massachusetts International Festival of the Arts, and our music director, Tian Inc. So shout out to them. And uh, I loved this work. This was one of the duets, Despojo, for clarinet and piano that was commissioned. And I loved this work so much that I actually commissioned it myself to become a full sonata. And it now is a three movement sonata um, entitled Sonata Santera, which I'll be recording and releasing forthcoming. After that, uh, you do hear the work, and then we launch into some of the excerpts uh, from the work that we think are significant, talk about them, and some of the issues that this work brings up from colonialism, religious syncretism, uh, rhythm from bomba, the Olande, and rhythm from salsa. So I hope you enjoy, and without further ado, here is the interview. So I was listening to your recording of A Metaphor for Power today, and that's actually a premiere that I was at when the New Jersey Symphony uh, performed your work, A Metaphor for Power. Um, by the way, can people find that recording anywhere? Can people listen to that? There is a recording uh, on the New Jersey Symphony um, SoundCloud, but yeah, it, th there was some issues on the sound editing and it doesn't, you know, you, you can't really appreciate the whole piece, but there is, you know, if people might want to know, you know, some sort of idea of how the piece is or how the piece goes, then the, their SoundCloud is available, but still, you know. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Well, I, I hope people, you know, just go check it out and listen. And I hope that this piece is performed more often. You know, I remember at the premiere, I had at the end in particular, there were just like shockwaves that went up my spine when I heard, and I was listening to, I listened to it all this morning again, and I had the same sensation of at the end where, with the minor setting of the national anthem, um, dun, 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 and then there's the held note. You know, and actually it was so pure. I thought it was a flute and I looked in the score, it's C trumpet. That yeah. surprised me, it's so beautiful. And then you hear these other notes that kind of come in because they're so quiet and, and make you kind of question what the tonality is. It was minor in this melody that we know should be major. And right. uh, as we're questioning the tonality, uh, it seems like it's resolved for a second there too, you know? Yeah. And then you hear that tritone in the bells and it just throws everything off and you question everything again. And it just like, I, I'm not a crier, but I kind of lost it this morning again, thinking about how powerful that ending of that work is and how it relates to your experience, because I know you and we're friends, your experience being American and being from Puerto Rico. Um, so anyway, that's just one example of how powerful your music is. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that work. Well, I mean, uh, if if you all want to go and check it out, it will, you know, it will mean a lot to me. And it's a it's a work that I never thought I was writing for it to be performed. It was more of a cathart cathartic work that I just needed to write, and it just so happened that it got performed that soon. And it's it's really a piece that means a lot to me. Mm. Wow, and to have it performed by just a major orchestra like that was so cool. Um, now, 
transitioning to works that I've actually played and how I know you, which is um, being the clarinetist for this chamber orchestra, uh, Victory Players, which you've written for now several times. We're a Perot plus percussion ensemble. And, uh, you know, I should shout out now MIFA, Massachusetts Institution, Ma Massachusetts International Festival of the Arts, and our music director, Tien, who is really responsible for starting this whole process of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, yeah. But th this work you wrote, um, Transmutacion, or Inert, Inert Transmutation, um, yeah. which, which we actually just recorded, and that will that may be available actually, at least the video may be available from WGBH by the time this airs. So if that's available, I will link to that as well. Um, and this is just another work. I mean, and this one I know is floating around on YouTube. So if listeners wanted to, I don't know if that's okay or not, but if it is out there on YouTube. I'm not showing it here, um, but gosh, that's a powerful work. It's just so incredible. And I listened to the end, again, the end of this work, you know, you hear little fragments of this melody, the, the Puerto Rican lament. And at the end, it sounds like a full orchestra. How do you even do that? This is six people and you listen. And I mean, part of it is Claire and Ellie, our strings. They're just, the molto vibrato they're using is so, but I mean, it sounds like the New Jersey Symphony, like the full deal. I just don't even know how this is possible. And then if you just rewind a little bit from there, you'll see the piano cadenza. And if you're gonna listen to anything from today, listen to that piano cadenza, because it's just, I mean, who does that? Who does that? <laughs> that, pi that piano cadenza is, is straight up abusive. <laughs> I, mean, I know, I know. We've talked about it. <laughs> well. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The thing, the the thing uh, with that, it's it's something that I think has happened in classical music history since its conception, uh, but for some reason nowadays we don't think of of classical music that way. And since because it it has become this kind of monolith of kind of like a museum, you know, you go to classical music to see what happened in the 19th and 18th century. Uh, we no longer associate classic, classical music with living people, but usually when composers wrote things like that, uh, for example, the cadenza that I wrote for Nathan, it's because they had some sort of relationship with the person, you know, and because, shout out to Mifa again, uh, the first time I went there, we got all together and uh, we talked a lot during the evenings, uh, you know, about he, he went to Juilliard. I'm also finishing my doctorate in Juilliard. So we kind of connected in a particular way. And I thought, well, you know, uh, I saw him perform. So, I mean, play, uh, rehearse some music that was very difficult. And I thought, well, you know, I might just throw in something uh for him because of that same relationship, you know? Oh, I love that so much. And Nathan, I mean, Nathan is another case of he doesn't even know how good he is. I mean, and that cadenza, you see it and you see it like fully presented how incredible of a pianist he is. But we should also shout out, and I didn't know this pianist, um, Alfonso Fuentes, who, who is your influence for the, the, the cadenza. Uh, and I, I was looking up some of his music today. He's actually written a, a fair amount of works, even for woodwinds. Um, but do you want to say anything about him or what influenced this cadenza? Well, I mean, he is my, he, I, I always call him my teacher. He was my, my studio teacher in the, in the Puerto Rican conservatory. And uh, he changed the way I think about music completely because he is a nationalist when it comes to, to, uh, composing classical music, you know, instead of looking outwards, you look inwards. And uh, he is just a, a insane improviser. You know, he improvised, you know, I, any style, whatever you want, as hard as you can imagine. You know, it's so incredible the way he can put together things out of the blue. And I thought, and all of that, then he just sprinkle in some 
Puerto Rican bomba or plena influences or salsa or merengue or whatever you want. You just he just puts it in because he likes it, you know. And uh, that that kind of stayed with me throughout my undergrad years and throughout my whole career. And I still talk to him about that. And it, that has usually not only influenced that cadenza, which has a lot of, you know, Puerto Rican rhythms in it, d despite this, the very late romantic kind of impression that it can give. Uh, it also kind of makes me th th his influence makes me write for the piano as virtuoso as 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 you could possibly showcase for someone that can possibly do that you know yeah wow that is so cool um you know i grew up playing jazz music and so i did like you know learn jazz standards and kind of like how to improvise a little bit but i find today and i think this is changing very slowly but very few at least if you're if you're coming up through the university kind of system in this country, very few musicians are are comfortable in learning to improvise today, and I do think and I hope that that will change because just like there's so much joy of music for me that is contained in the art of improvisation in any genre, you know that doesn't have to be in bomba or salsa or jazz standard, you know any or any one thing or you know, um, but you know that. That's very interesting because uh, my first my first instrument was saxophone, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> right. I and, love that. <laughs> and then I switched to violin and piano, right? And I used to play in church, and there are not cheap music in church, and rehearsals are just like, what's the key or the pseudo key that you're playing, and you just follow on, uh, and. I never knew, I mean, improv improvising is composing. You know, when you're improvising, you're creating, you're composing. And I think that's why it's so important. And that's why it needs uh, the tide that you see that it's changing. It's so important that it actually changes because you become part of, of the creative process with whatever piece you're performing if you're able to improvise what I compose and what drives my composition is precisely that seed of improvisation. You know, I, uh, people often ask me, well, how do you start a piece? And I say, I just, I don't know. I just write. And then once you begin improvising, you can then lay down a structure and pick whatever uh, motive you like from whatever you already wrote down and develop it. Mm, very interesting. I think we'll talk about your process too. Um, you know, for example, with this, the sonata that I've now just received, you know, we're going to be talking about Despojo today, um, which is now the first okay. movement of a full sonata, a three movement sonata. And I think if I'm not wrong, I think I asked for that to be done in like April. <laughs> it's done. Correct. <laughs> it's done. And not, actually, you know, I, I can show the cover page, I guess. It's, yes, it's yes. done. It's, the art is done, too. <laughs> and the solo piece, too. So I can't show this, but I can show the cover page. A solo yes. solo for solo clarinet, and I'll be recording this soon. So stay tuned. There's amazing clarinet music coming from you um, that I'm so excited to share with everyone. Um, okay, one more little shout-out that I just I have to do is um, your... I think it's for Pioneer Symphony, right? This this Xmas realness extravaganza. Yeah. Come on, I mean, what else do you need to know? I was you sent this to me, and I listened, and yeah. I, I was like, is this is this a bunch of Christmas songs in a double fugue? <laughs> Who does this? Is this possible? What I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I mean when I when the music director Tian, he's just amazing. He just reached out to me, and he was. Uh, he, he told me, I mean, I want to do a premiere for for the Pioneer Symphony, something, you know, Christmas. And he just reached out to me. And if you ask, if you just listen to my music, you would think that I am the most non-holiday person ever. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I my music tends to be somber and introspective and sometimes 
kind of demands some sort of, of active listening. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm also, I tend to be kind of this jokey, laid back person. <laughs> If you really know me, you know that I, I, I don't take things too seriously. So when he said Christmas, I, I thought, well, okay, we're talking about a, 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 an orchestra that mostly plays classical music and they are doing this Christmas pops or holiday pops concert. Why don't I blend all of that with a spice of my Puerto Ricanness? Mm -hmm. You know, and you you hear, uh, "Oh Holy Night" in a bolero, and then it changes <laughs> into a mambo, and you know you hear "Twelve uh, Days of Christmas" with Tchaikovsky's uh. Nutcracker behind. You hear a double fugue on Sleigh Ride and Merry Christmas because just because you you have a, amazing musicians in the Pioneer Symphony. Pioneer Valley Symphony, and why not give them or uh, the 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 opportunity to really showcase what they can do, mm -hmm. but with the spin of holidays. <laughs> right, gosh, that is so amazing. I need to re-listen to this now and catch all of that. <laughs> uh, I just love that so much, and people are. I actually relate that to that too because people like I have a weird obsession with Christmas music. It's really weird, and people are always <laughs> surprised to hear that from me. So. Um, and that work in particular. So look for that. That premiere's coming as well. That has not been premiered yet, right? That's in December. Not yet, yes. Right. Okay. In December, uh, December 11th will be the premiere. And the, it would be broadcasted lo locally, I think, on the 14th of December. Okay. 13th or 14th of December uh, in the Boston, Boston area. Okay, so there's a way to catch it. Cool. Yes. Um, okay, so now we should kind of transition to what we're actually here to talk about, so, um, which is this, this new work for clarinet and piano. Um, you know, and I just want to say before we do that, one last thing. It's not, you know, obviously, like your technique as a composer is, is incredible. It's, it's just insane what, you know, we've talked about the clarinet repertoire, and I feel like sometimes you know the clarinet repertoire better than me, you know, with, with a terminal <laughs> degree in clarinet, literally. Um, and it's, it's, your technique is amazing, but that's not even what makes you such an in incredible composer to me. It's, it's that you take that time, like what, what we were talking about with Nathan, that you take that time to get to know the composers or the performers that you're writing for. And, you know, in this piece in particular that we're going to talk about, Despojo, uh, you know, I feel like you know my abilities more than I do, you know? And when you're sending me little excerpts like, Maestro, is this possible? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's possible. Well, but, you know, I like to think anything's possible on the clarinet, but my gosh, you pushed me. And, you know, with, the, with these C sharps, high altissimo C sharps, that I think we'll play that excerpt today. Um, but, so this, this first movement of Sonata Santera, this uh, Death de Poho, um, can you tell us about it? And how did, just how did this work come about? Well, you know, It, everything starts with with a concept, right? And when uh, Mifa again, uh, they wanted to do this uh, identity duet, you know, a m musical duet. It, they commissioned a whole bunch of of living composers, to uh, mostly Puerto Rican, to write duets uh, about their identity, how they feel as Puerto Ricans or uh, and Americans, and the current. Uh, colonial status of our island, etc. And I, I began to think, well, okay, what, what's the story behind Puerto Rico? And yeah, we have, we, it, it's fair to say that we can have sort of an identity crisis sometimes because most of our uh, pre-colonial history basically disappeared or was destroyed and murdered. Mm. Uh, but, you know, we, we can only live in the now and try to fix the, the problems. And the, thinking about that, the thing that came to mind was that through the Atlantic slave trade, the, the Spanish conquistadores brought in uh, a lot of Nigerian slaves uh, and 
the, there were the, there were a lot of uh, from different regions from Africa, but the 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 main were from Nigeria that carried with them the Yoruba tradition and Yoruba religion. But then, of course, if you want to survive in in a colonized territory, you need to kind of redress your beliefs so they can adhere to the entities that are governing at the moment, right? Uh, so the the people that believed in 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 the Yoruba religion, they syncretized that with Catholicism. And I'm thinking, well, that's my history. You know, that's part of my history. That's part of my identity. And I, I usually focus, as you mentioned, in A Metaphor for Power in the current day issue, you know, like, okay, I am an American and why is it so hard to feel like an American when I am brown skinned and I come from a little island that after Hurricane Maria received help so late that lots of my friends and, and people that I love died. But in this particular piece, I wanted to look back to what formed that current Puerto Rico that we live in. And I, the, the only thing that was in my mind and kept coming to my mind was that syncretism. And then, again, I need to come back to the, the current days where we're basically in a pandemic. So I thought, well, okay, part of what happened uh, from that syncretism was Santeria. You know, right when, when all that syncretism happened, it, it stemmed out from it the, the Santeria religion, which is... It's very active in Puerto Rico, also in Cuba, and I would say throughout the Caribbean. And even there are uh, similar uh, versions of it in Mexico. And I thought, well, okay, let me take the good from this historic religion and try to at, at, take that that what can that bring me for a situation like today that we're in a pandemic and i thought of the different rituals and one of them is despojo which is spanish for a cleanse mm -hmm. <laughs> and i'm thinking well okay we kind of need a cleanse right mm -hmm. now don't we uh -huh. and that was <laughs> that was mm -hmm. basically my main inspiration i thought okay i'm just gonna write about that cleansing and i'm gonna take all uh, i'm gonna try to invoke that kind of ritual which uh it has rhythms it had sh it has chants it, it, it has a lot of different things that the the priest or priestess do does to the people to the person getting the the cleansing so i thought well okay we need to create that mystical kind of environment and then drop in all the rhythm that that we can so we can make in, make it like we say in puerto rico you know flavorful mm -hmm. we, we can make it with con, con sabor ah, <laughs> and I love it. and i i focus then on on the bomba rhythm holande which is a rhythm that it's not the main rhythm that we use uh when we play bomba in puerto rico but it's one of the rhythms and i i kind of liked it and i said well okay this the whole piece is going to be based on this rhythm and we're going to make this cleansing happen with all of this mm -hmm. <laughs> wow that is so cool. When you talk about this, it just makes me want to really be able to perform this well. Uh, it's just oh, you so will. Powerful. Come on. <laughs> uh, woo. Um, okay, just backing up a little bit. We've talked. A, you, you've mentioned the the actual despojo, the cleanse. Um, can you can you talk a little bit more about that? And what is your experience? Have, can I ask if you've had one? What does this look like? Well, it's it's something that. Uh, Puerto Rico is a very Christian, uh, like I said, Judeo-Christian religion island. But we, we, we have kind of like a joke that uh, we, we, some people, we say they are like uh, Catholic Santeros because they are Catholic the whole year round. But by the end of the year, they go, you know, <laughs> secretly to a Santero or a Santera to get a cleanse, you know? Oh. <laughs> So have I have wow. I gotten one? Maybe. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so you know, oh, it, wow. it's kind of tradition. But what happens during that ritual is that the the priest or priestess gathers a whole bunch of different uh, 
plants, you know, uh, some that might have personal cleansing uh, properties to that particular priest or some that are more standard. Uh, usually also they, they use flowering plants, you know, so you can have the flowers in there. Uh, and they concoct some sort of uh, liquid that they will spray on you or throw on you. And they just chant to mm -hmm. clean everything away. And they hit you with the mm -hmm. different uh, wow. plants uh, in a particular rhythm. So you can get everything out. And then they give you a little assignment. You know, they give you the, the concoction with some candles and some wow. other things. And they, give, they tell you, you will do this, you know, light up the candle and you will take a bath with this thing and you will stay i don't know how much time and then you will go to the beach and break an egg or something you know uh, it's a whole process and the beauty of it is that it can be different depending on the priest but it's all based on the same santeria so it's it, it's kind of like culturally culturally so rich you know wow that is so there's a rhythm to the way they hit you with plants there's a rhythm yes Oh, yes. wow. That is so interesting. That is so cool. And yeah, like and a, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. Go ahead. it's different depending on, 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 the, on the priest or priestess. Usually it's a priestess. Uh, and this comes, again, because of the Yoruba religion. Not all priests or priestesses practice the, 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 the thing with the rhythm, uh, but some do because... The Yoruba tradition, they, they, their pantheon of deities, all of them, when you are going to summon them for a major uh, ceremony, which is called the Bembe, which is the last movement of the Sonata, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the way they summon all of these deities is by playing their rhythm in a set of drums called Bata. And that uh, mixed out with Santeria as well in a way that then if you want to use, uh, you, if you want to invoke the deity that opens doors and gives you uh, success or whatever, then there is a rhythm for that and they will use that rhythm. Wow, that is so cool. And there's a lot to unpack there as well. Like a new layer of the syncretism you're talking about in that Puerto Rican Catholics participate in this at the end of the year, which is so beautiful yeah. in a way. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a way of syncretism and also a way, an unconscious way of keep keeping parts of the culture alive mm -hmm. because, you know, Colonialism is so complicated. <laughs> right. Wow. Um, okay, so I think we've said enough. Let's play. Um, let's play the performance. This is a distance recorded performance that we did um, during. That was in January, I believe. It aired on NEPM. So we're going to air this performance. Um, I just want to disclaim this was performed with a click track because we're recording it um, distance. So I. I'm so excited to re-record this live and just have all the kind of malleability I think this piece needs. So I do just want a disclaimer that, but um, okay, here is the um, performance of um, De Fojo. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, so let, let's talk about this fugue. I'm gonna play this little clip, and then you gotta explain what's going on here. Well, you know yeah. that you you know that uh, in fugues, you you need. I mean, in not in fugues, in sonatas, you need to develop after the exposition and you know the, the traditional form of the sonata. You have the exposition of your material, and then either you repeat da capo or you develop. And I was thinking, well, okay, if the piece, as I said earlier, is based on rhythm and that mystical kind of cleansing magical thing what can i do with rhythm that it's at least not that expected because when you are when you think of rhythm you think of layering the rhythm or you think of of focusing on on mm. on just the drive that it can bring mm -hmm. but i said well what if i if i turn that rhythm into some sort of still rhythmic melodic material because there are not a lot of 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 uh like steps you know continual step that that you can say well you know it's a stepwise melody or it's also very or, staccato you know, it's, yeah it's very staccato it's very disjointed uh, the, the the melodic material so you are at you you will actually feel and hear that it's rhythmic material And once I got that, I said, well, you know, why don't we do a fugue on it? I mean, <laughs> a fugue is just, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's another formula. So let's just do that fugue because it's unexpected and it's nice to have. And it also serves to highlight the clarinet because once you, once you have all the voices in, you can then utilize the clarinet in a more legato way. So it can contrast with the with the piano, and then you have a lot of ah. rhythmic, motivic, and performance-wise rich richness 
right. that doesn't interfere with each other. You know, right. it, it all works together without making it muddy or, mm -hmm. you know, or difficult to listen to. Now, how all of that fits together, that's beyond me. I'm a theory nerd, but I'm not a theorist, so I don't know how it all sounds good together, but it does. And now I'm just looking at what you said, the legato, that upper register melody that comes through is so beautiful, and yet the piano is still going crazy with, with the fugue, really. Um, yeah. You know, and there's, as, as you're talking, I'm realizing as well, it's like another layer of the syncretism of this is a traditional structure. It's like the Catholicism part of it. Yes. There's a tradition to a fugue that just goes so far back. So that's a, like another layer of how brilliant that, that is. So far back and so, so religiously followed and structured and, and theoretically formed, you know, you, you, people will speak of traditional real fugues and fugatos or non-traditional fugues that people might do that are fugue inspired or whatever be, be, precisely because of that it's just that same uh syn syncretism of music you know it's like we'll, we'll just mix it up because wow. we can <laughs> oh that's so brilliant i love that wow um okay let me play one more clip just because i feel like i had to work on this so hard <laughs> that i have to share this part um and we have to talk about it because I know there's something in the rhythm here that we wanted to talk about. When I saw I mean, that, again, I was like, we... no, 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 no. <laughs> we go back to the same, to the same argument with Nathan, you know, if I wanted, you know, you talked to me about writing you something, I think a couple of days or a week after we met in Mifa the, of the first time, you know, and we kind of got along together very quickly. We became friends very quickly and it was, you know, something meant to be. And... I didn't write anything until now that I wrote you this sonata because I really wanted to, to know you and know you're playing a lot and, and know everything. And once I, I knew all of that, I said, well, you know, let's just extend it over there to the stratosphere. But it's also, you know, it, it, there are many layers to all of this. First, it's you. So I'm writing something that, number one, I know you can do. And number two, it's it, it showcase what the instrument can do. You know, it, 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 we we can see that high C sharp and think, oh my God, it's you know it's almost in Mars because of how high it is, and and it's so hard. But it's set before with an incredibly staccato with occasional uh tight notes uh section that it's incredibly tiring for your embouchure you know so oh, I i'm know. i'm thinking of, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so i'm thinking what if we are going to set this we need to set this so a clarinet player sees you perform and and say oh my god mm -hmm. you know when when they when they see that passage and see it happen it's like did he just do that? Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. number one, I know you can do it. And number two, I want you to shine. Mm -hmm. So it's part of, 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 you know, for you to play it, I want you to feel proud that you accomplished something, but also that people can appreciate the things that perhaps you don't say about yourself or you don't show about yourself because you're too humble and, you're just an artist and you just like to play and that's it, you know? So, well, if you're not saying it, then I'll say it through the music. <laughs> and you, you'll end up saying it anyway by performing it. <laughs> uh-huh. We'll just see if I can do it live. I'm going to need some tree bark, a good, good read. <laughs> good read for this one. 
And that comes back, by the way. I should, you know, first of all, the second movement. I just like can't wait for people to hear the second movement. It's so, it's <laughs> so stunning. Um, but the third movement, the C sharp comes back w with a yes. vengeance. <laughs> to the vengeance, yes. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Now the the rhythm though in the staccato part. That's what I wanted to talk about as well. Da, 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 da. What is this rhythm that keeps happening? It's in the piano and then the clarinet kind of takes it. Yes, that is the Hollande yeah. rhythm. It's the Hollande. And this is from Bomba. That's the Hollande. Yes. yes. From, but mm -hmm. then when the piano, I can't remember the precise measure, but when the piano finally arrives at full chords right before the, yep. the yeah. climax, I mixed two different rhythms and I have one hand doing the Hollande and then another hand doing the cascara rhythm from salsa music. And I'm mixing the two, Leaves. which I really, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I the, the, again, the, the person that performed so this cool. for that recording is Nathan. Right. So I was thinking, okay, I know Nathan as well, <laughs> but before I did this, before I did this, I spent, I think, three days doing exercises with my hands, trying to mix the rhythms to see how I felt mixing those two rhythms. Ah. And if I felt I could dominate those two rhythms, just clapping, uh, and he will just be, you know, punching chords. So it's very similar as, as just clapping on a, on, on a table or something, or, put, you know, hitting your hands on a table or something. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing doing that to see if it was actually possible to, to, to separate your hemispheres, to really create that, that polyrhythm. And right when I, when I arrived at that and, and I was able to, to do it myself, I said, well, okay, let's just write it down. And, and the whole piece, and that, that's also part of, of making it interesting. The whole piece is based on one rhythm, but right before the climax, you hear another one, mm, you know, another, the, another one that, it, that, wasn't in the whole piece uh, and it just came there and someone that knows salsa if it's listening to you perform that piece it will that moment will just jump out of the music oh, for, wow. for them wow it's almost as if the i mean there's so much going on in terms of pitch content in that moment as well but it's almost like the piano is really more of a of a percussionist at that point correct you know, yes. you're like challenging them on the level of like a real percussionist at that point that's crazy yes Wow, that is so cool. Which then, you know, it, it evolves all the way to the third movement where the pianist has to do percussion with, with himself and with the instrument, but literally have to do yes. percussion. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. Me too, actually. I think. You too, yes. I practice that too. <laughs> so, um, and just, okay, really quick, I just want to ask so we don't breeze over it because I know most of our listeners probably won't know even what Bomba is. So can you give us right. kind of like, what's the, can you give us a quick... What is bomba and why is it significant and what, what does it have to do with Puerto Rico? Well, bomba is the quintessential Puerto Rican music. It's, it, it, its birthplace was in Puerto Rico and it's still practiced in Puerto Rico and it's very culturally significant. And bomba, it's another ramification or a, let's just say another... Um, event that happened because of the syncretism and because of the slave trade. Uh, the rhythms that we do in Bomba are, and, and, and the things we do with Bomba are reminiscent of the summoning uh, of the deities that we do in Debembe, in, in Santeria or in, uh, in the Yoruba uh, religion, right? Uh, but then Bomba became uh, its own thing and it developed its own rhythms that are based on rhythms, uh, African rhythms. Sorry. And it became this, this whole process. You know, it, it, when you do the Bomba the traditional way, uh, usually f me females and male uh, dancers, you, but they both can dance, but usually... The, the biggest showcase, uh, it's done by a woman because she, uh, she wears this gigantic skirt that has a lot of layers and she used the skirt in many different ways. 
but you have a, a, a whole bunch of different uh, drums, you know, they are, are all are called barril, which is Spanish for barrel. Again, because the, the Puerto Rican slaves, uh, they didn't have anything to perform with. So they took the, you know, the barrels that were thrown out and they turned it into wow. instruments. And, you know, they just created that to have a good time, etc. But the magic about this is that there is a small, a smaller, a smaller drum or a leader, you know, the, the, the prime drummer that improvises with the dancer. So, uh, and it's an improvisation where, you know, you have a basic rhythm happening, the, the, It's you know, the, the rhythm that they decide to do and the rhythm that the dancer decides to, to dance. And then the dancer enters and salutes the drummer. You know, it bows to the drum. And then the dancer begins to do different movements and the drum needs to play the rhythm of the movements that the dancer is doing. And that needs to happen to the point where they are completely synchronized. And the dancer keeps on dancing, doing movement, movements as subtle, as big as taking the, the, the skirt and flapping it and throwing it in the air or whatever. And as little as just moving your, sh your shoulders. You know, it's, it, it, it's very, very, very subtle and very, very complex. And the thing with, with all of the, and that's why, you know, I, I, I love Bomba so much. And that was one of the, the, I would say the teaching moments, I won't say struggle, the teaching moments that I had to do in Juilliard because my music is inspired mostly by bomba. So it, there, is a, there are a lot of layers in my music. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had to explain that to people. So, you know, mm. mainly to teachers. So they, so they got it, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the, the beauty of all of this is that you have a very precise rhythm happening in the background, right? very, very precise, that it can also be complex. You know, the rhythm is happening, but it, it could be, a, 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 you know, like, there are, they are complex rhythms. But then the dancer, it's not just adding to that rhythm. The dancer is doing polyrhythm with compound, uh, you know, rhythmic uh, phrases, right. you know, the, to the point where they're they're five against seven, you know, three against seven or four, you know, the, the, it, those kind of, of polyrhythmic things begin to happen because the, the, the dancer hears the drummers performing and then to synchronize and to dare the drummer. Wow. Then she or him begins to do rhythms outside of the, uh, right. of, The, the rhythm, the main rhythm that it's happening. And it becomes this super rich thing. It's, it, it's, an, it's totally an experience and, and it's so beautiful to see as well. So if you ever go to Puerto Rico, just make sure to at least go to Loisa to see mm. people dancing bomba. Right. And we're seeing images um, from there now that are, I mean, the, the kind of protest nature of this music as well in the way that it's being used today, which is so beautiful. But I just want to say, um, you know, because when we recorded, I should shout out this, uh, you know, Inner transmut Transmutation will be on an album that's coming out. We recorded a bunch of music this summer, the Victory Players. Um, one piece, another piece we recorded um, by one, one of our composers, um, you know, actually called for Pierrot plus percussion plus three bomba drummers plus <laughs> bomba dancer, which just so happens in, in Holyoke, where we're based, that's where Bomba Day Aki is. So we got to work with this amazing right. bomba group in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, Brenda, the main dancer, um, you know, with this beautiful gown, just for me, like being able to observe this tradition, you know, at, at like the highest level was so incredible. Um, and it, it, it You know, she's, I should say too, she's married to the main drummer in this group, right? And so I asked her at some point, it seems like sometimes you're trying to like throw him off. Is this like, there's like a, <laughs> there's like a challenge element to this that's like so fun. And she's like, yeah. oh yeah, I try to throw him off all the time. That's like the whole point of this. And she's like, sometimes I try to like do something over here where he can't see or <laughs> right. <laughs> like, there are no rules. Like that's so cool. It's, yeah. It's, and it's, it's, it's fantastic because you can just 
go in the, and and that's something very beautiful about uh our puerto rican culture you enter into that sacred space of dancing just to be yourself mm. and do whatever you want you know it's mm -hmm. your expression because even though it's very structured the rhythms are happening in, in the background when the dancer called baila bailador or bailadora uh dances it's their own thing what they are doing you know you do whatever you want so it, it's it's a form of expression that highlights who you are just mm, because of who you are that's so beautiful i felt i should say too in this piece one of the things it calls to do which is not normal i understand in bomba is uh the violin um clarinet and flute are improvising with the dancer and we are trying to catch what the dancer is doing. I guess that's not the, normally what's happening, but we got to do that. And one of, you know, our flutist is Puerto Rican, so he had no problem. He, like, he got it. He's like, <laughs> I got this. So, but, I mean, Ellie and I were a little nervous, I'll be honest. Like, we don't, we don't want to do this and, you know, screw it up or do something stupid. But in this Bomba de Aquí, they made us feel so comfortable. And maybe my Bomba is a little too Benny Goodman. But, like, I got to be... <laughs> <laughs> but I got to be but myself I mean, and it was and they made but, me right. feel so comfortable and I just like it was such a beautiful experience that I'll never forget and I was just so grateful to so to be so welcomed into that world so it was just you know I'll never forget that but yes okay so we have gone way over time um so we have so much <laughs> material <laughs> um so let's let's wrap this um So what else should I say? Is there anything else you want to tell us about anything or anything you want to go into, you know, more depth about? Well, uh, I, I, I think the important thing uh, for, for all of you to consider when listening to this and listening to anything is that uh, we... Cl classical music, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's seen as this monolith of an antiquity, right? But we all exist in it. And it's not, it's not that, sen you know, Eurocentric white thing anymore. You know, we are all part of it. We're, we all can be part of it. And it can be culture defining as it has been, you know, throughout the, you know, the years, you know, the hundreds of years. Uh, and just keep uh, opening the doors for, for diversity in classical music and, and just listen for the sake of listening, you know. Lily Boulanger, Nadia, the, the mm -hmm. sister of right. the famous Nadia Boulanger, used to say that music is just that, music. Mm -hmm. And music is just that. It's music. And there is no high or low or medium or sideways or artsy or non-artsy. Non it's mm -hmm. just a personal, personal expression, expression. Uh, of something that you cherish, that you want someone else to, to that, that you feel proud of and you just want to to show it to someone else and give it and share, you know, you just want to share it. So let's just work for, for classical music to keep expanding and becoming that. <laughs> that part. I can't add anything to that. It's so beautiful. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. Oh, thank you for oh. the opportunity. You know, you know, I love talking to you. <laughs> I love talking to you. It's a privilege. So, um, yes. Okay. So I think we've covered everything. And so obviously we've pre-recorded this, um, so we could get a better quality video and audio for you today and kind of edit some, some of the clips we were talking about with maybe the score, if we want to show little bits of it. Um, but we, uh, want to give you our social media because we'll be live answering questions that you may have. So please reach out to us. You can email us or find us on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, Yvonne, how can people find you? They can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Ivan E. Composer. Uh, and Facebook, they can find me Ivan Enrique Rodriguez. 
Uh, but, you know, uh, my email is ivan at ivanrodriguezmusic.com. You can throw me a message uh, at any of them, and I'll gladly, if I know the answer, respond. Please don't ask me about the meaning of life, or if there are aliens, or if there is life in Mars, because I don't know. <laughs> so I'll put all of that there, too, so they can see everything. And you can find me. Just go to Instagram, Eric Schultz Clarinet, and I'll put all my information here. Or go to my website. Um, so, yeah, I think we can end there. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks for all of your time. I really appreciate it. No, thank this you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you. <laughs> it's so funny we feel the need to wave in, in right. things. It just makes sense. Yeah.